righteousness. We have hope in righteousness. Last week we were we talked about the physical transformation that was going to happen in our hope, right? Where we, we, have, we get to look forward to that physical body. Um, this week is all about righteousness. It's the spiritual side. We get a spiritual transformation too. WWJD. Anybody know what that means? No. WWJD. What would Jesus do? We were real big back in the 1900s. And I, if you were at the men's meeting last night of the men's supper, you, you got a little bit of a, a taste of this. Um, so this is a rerun. But what would Jesus do? It's a new. There's a new song that comes out that's come out here recently. It's been played a lot on the radio. And the lyrics go something a little bit like, uh, what would Jesus do? He would love first. He would love first. So it just sparked my interest. What, what, when, what would Jesus, was it the 90s? Can't remember if I was, if I was in high school and on fire for the Lord, if I was in the military and laughing at it when it came out, when all the little bracelets and everyone had to match bracelets on and you're giving bracelets out. It, it went alongside with the friendship bracelets of the early 90s. And I did a little bit more research and found out that um, Charles Shelton in the late 1800s had a book titled, In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And that's when it first became popular in the United States. And that, that, that author was inspired mo mainly by the doctrine and the theology of our very own John Wesley. See, John Wesley has a concept of Christian perfection, I'm going to tell you right now, don't go telling Christian perfection to people who are not Wesleyan because they don't like those words. I remember going through the <laughs> going through a Bible college and, and I, when I first got heard this what this Christian perfection was, I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. I wanted to know more of it. I was talking with a family member that's in law. I won't point him out. It's Christian perfection is impossible to be a perfect Christian. It's not what Christian perfection means. It means a perfect love for the Father. That you love Him more than you do anything else or anybody else. You want His will above your own. You want His desires above your own. That's Christian perfection. We don't leave the little, you know, I remember as a kid that I had that visual where we allow Jesus into our house of our heart, you know, the heart, that, it's like our house. But we, and we'll let Him anywhere in the, in the living room and in the kitchen. But don't go to that back closet. That one's closed off for me. Christian perfection is unless you, he, he, can say he gets rain over everything. That's what Christian perfection is. I love it. And I think about Charles Shelton and how he wrote on this. What would Jesus do? It's all about the heart. It's not what he did. It's why he did it. It was his motivation on the inside. That's what righteousness is. And those who are, who are studying Galatians with us on Thursday nights, you're going to recognize this this set of scripture, we're going to read reading out of Galatians 5, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. If you have God's word, I'll trust that you do. You can go ahead and turn to it. Um, but we're going to stand for the reading like we have the last couple of weeks, just out of respect for his word. So while we stand, if you do not have it, you can follow along on the screen here. Galatians, this is Paul's letter to the Galatians, to those in Galatia. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened by, again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from Christ. For through spirit we eagerly await. Church, say eagerly await. Eagerly if you were here last week, we said that, didn't we? If you are here the week before, we said something very, very similar. It's like these two words keep popping up. Eagerly await by faith for the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Well, the only thing that accounts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I said a little yeast works through a whole batch of dough. I am confident that in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, 
Why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Ouch. That is the reading of the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I ask that you source me in a way that this speaks the truth, not just boldly and loudly, but that it strikes to the heart of the, the, those that are listening, to this great crowd that is assembled here in Washington and to the crowd we have gathering online. Lord, I ask that your word reaches the heart of those who hear. Jesus, you said many times in your ministry, he who has ears, let him hear. You want the word to not just be heard, but to be applied in our lives. Allow us to leave here, to leave our services today, transformed more in your image, more in that image of righteousness that you have called us to live. We ask these things in your name, and all God's kids said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Context. We're only going to look at one verse, just one out of all of that. But I want you to guys to think about how angry Paul is here. He's hot. He is angry. He's mad. Um, again, if you if you get to study with Galatians with us on Thursday nights, and some of this is going to be rehashed because we look at little pieces of, of the scripture and we're working our way through Galatians. And we look and see what, what it talks to us and how that word applies to us. But here, Paul is extremely angry. Why? How? See, there was a tense at that time of of Jews coming through and saying, hey, you need to be circumcised to be a real Christian. Uh, that would never happen here, right? You don't go to church, you're not a real Christian. Shame on you people at home. No way you're a real Christian if you don't go to church. Oh, you read that version of the Bible? You're not a real Christian unless you read my version of the Bible. We have that in churches all over the country right now. There was a church I interviewed once that if I didn't preach out of a certain version, they didn't want to hear it. I said, well, you don't want to hear it. Because <laughs> I use a lot of them. Ever since being here, I believe I've preached out of ASV, NASB, NIV, and I'm, I think the, 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 one of the good translations are some, some along the lines. It's like three or four. So yeah, I still haven't hit the translation that they had to have in their services. But I look at the tone of his writings, he's He's again coming against those and saying, hey, you have to do this to be a Christian. To be a true follower of Christ, you've got to do this. We're looking at verses, in verse 2, it says, mark my words. It's very poignant about that. Verse 3, I declare, you have alienated, you have fallen short. In verse 4, look at verse 12. For those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Ouch. Can I get an ouch from a man? <laughs> Because let me let me paint a picture. Yes, it's mutilate. Let me go the, if, for those who are casting doubt and those that are casting these lies. I wish they would go the whole way and, and just chop parts of themselves off. That's in a good old Daryl version. Ouch! He is not a happy person. Context was about the law of circumcision. But Pastor Darrell, we're supposed to be in hope. That's why the crowd is starting to gather. It's starting to get bigger because everyone loves hearing hope. Where's the hope? I'll get there. Oh, hold on. I, I, if you look at the law and you you say I got to, you have to do it this one way, the way I tell you, then you got to go look at the whole law. This is what Paul was telling them. That the yeast, the little little bit of little bit of legalism, is going to affect your entire spiritual life. You can't keep it locked up to that little closet. He was talking about how the law enslaves. And I, 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 that made me, reminded me of the parable of the prodigal son. The son goes off and squanders his dad's fortune and comes home and has a big part. What about the other son? Come here, think about that. He wasn't joyous. I think of the time when someone kneels at this altar, how we're joyous doesn't matter what they've done in the past. We're joyous that they're home. They were lost. They're now sad. They're now found. They were blind. They now can see. We're happy. That other son was upset. Why? Because he was a slave to the law and doing things to please his father. It wasn't about his motivation. It was about the things. Where's the hope that it was promised? Right in the middle of all the scrolling. One verse. It's verse 5. In the middle of all this 
darkness. There's that shine of light in verse 5. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith for the righteousness in which we hope. Where did that hope go? And I give that in context because even in the darkest of situations, there's always hope. We're we'll looking at a three parts here in the midst of all this harsh correction and this harsh scolding that Paul was giving. Full righteousness has a future hope. There is a future hope in full righteousness. Again, last week we looked at the physical transformation that, was, that awaits us. There is a physical transformation. There will come a day when we see our Father face to face. And we, you know, that song, I can only imagine, I don't know if I'm going to be able to kneel or if I'm going to jump around, if I'm going to run up and down, if I'm going to sing, I don't know if I'm going to fall flat on my face. I have no idea what it's going to be like, but it's going to be glorious. But in that time, it's going to come at that perfect transition, that physical transition in our own bodies. I think of my, my late father-in-law who has not had the use of his legs for many, many months. I guarantee you he's walking around. He has a physical transformation. We also have that hope of that spiritual transformation. That's what righteousness is. We have a spiritual transformation. We don't have to worry about the, the lusts of this world. We don't have to worry about the temptations. You know, I don't go into a gas station because I can smell that package of tobacco. And I, for a smoker for over 21 years, I, I, I don't know. That, that, that's, I love to swipe the card at the gas pump. Let me swipe it every time. I don't want to go in there and smell that, that, that nice, fresh, drool-causing tobacco. No. But see, that's inside my head. I can smell this cigarette from blocks away. It, it, the desires are inside. That full righteousness is what will be cleaned. With that eagerness of a child, that eagerly awake. Can you guys say eagerly awake? Eagerly awake. We said that last week. And the week before. Different texts. Man, it's the same exact term. It's that eagerness of a child on Christmas morning. That eagerness on the sun of the morning of a fishing trip I told you about last week. If you weren't there, you got to go back because he totally freaked me out. But he was eager to go fishing that morning. He was waiting. It's that eagerness of that Indy 500 spectators that are watching for the cars to come through and come around. Neck stretched out. That eagerness. We should have that same eagerness for that spiritual purity that's coming to you. Oh, can I get an amen there? Amen. Glory. It's that spiritual, it's that eagerness. Eagerness. If you're, if you're in God's word, you look back to verse chapter 3, verse 3. We're going to look at that a couple times today. He has the same group of people. Who, if they're trying to finish what God has started in spirit, we, we, Paul was going through this text saying, look, you're, you're trying to do physical things. To complete the work of God that he did in here, why are you trying to finish what only God can finish? Philippians 1.6 states, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He who began that work in you. So I believe I'm, I'm part of the camp. There's a, lot, there's a couple of different camps here in the Church of the Nazarene of what in turn, where the entire sanctification is. Some believe it's an instantaneous thing. Some believe it's a gradual thing. I'm one of the gradual thinkers. Make up your own mind. But I believe that he is molding me. He continues to mold me. Every week I pick up his book and I look into his word of what's going to be preached the next week. He molds me. Every time I get in the car and I turn on the radio and it, what would Jesus do? He would love first. I'm like, Man, that, that fits right in. He is molding me. He molds me physically, but he molds me more spiritually. See, it's a spiritual rightness. It's a spiritual perfection that is granted in the future. There's nothing we can do to attain it now. Nothing outwardly that we can do to attain it now. I don't care how many gas tanks this church fills, how many groceries we put on people's tables. There's nothing, no things that we can do that will attain that spiritual perfection in the future. Just as Paul was saying, it's not just about circumcision, the physical act of circumcising. It's about any act, any physical thing that we do. We can either strive for it. We can develop and progress in our relationship with the Father through His only Son. 
It will only be finished when we attain that heavenly glorification. See, Paul explains here that there's absolutely nothing we can do to obtain this perfection. We are to wait for it. It's that term of waiting for the physical renewal last week that we talked about through the pain of childbirth. If you remember that, that, that picture that he painted in Scripture. How painful childbirth is, there's going to be pain in that spiritual renewal too. I'm telling you right now, it's the renewal that I know that I've been healed from the addiction to nicotine. I don't think about it anymore when I wake up. I don't think about it every, every, every time I finish a meal, and I've finished a lot of meals. But that's the first thing I would think about, man. That was, dinner was so good, let's go light up. I know I'm, a, but that doesn't mean I still don't have to deal with the, the mental anguish and the pain every time someone lights up a cigarette. And I've got the car windows down because it's so pretty outside. Three, four cars up. Someone just lit up. I can see this pile of smoke go up. <laughs> doesn't mean that I still don't have the desire. See, that's what the righteousness is. We're, we're, we're going to find ourselves in purity. There's not going to be a desire for anything but the Father. Second thing is we wait through or by the Spirit. We eagerly await, or through the Spirit, we eagerly await. See, there's no physical task that will ever satisfy. But God, I'm a good person. I teach Sunday school, Lord. It's a sudden the Haley's heard, and I'm sure that if you've attended here for any amount of time, you've heard me say it again. Lord, I, I, I serve your church. Why can't I can't why can't I have kids? Why does this 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 girl over here who is strung out can have kids? Why are there lines at abortion clinics and I can't have a kid? I'm a good person, Father. What do I gotta do to earn this? I remember a man by the name of Job. See, it's a reality that we, a lot of times, we find ourselves in. There are bad things that happen to good people. <coughs> Matthew 5, 45 says, The rain comes down on the just and the unjust alike. I don't live in a different world just because I'm saved by grace and sanctified through His Spirit. I live in the same world that if it rains, it gets muddy. My feet gonna get muddy the same if I walk through it just as just as much as, as anybody else who walks through that mud. We live in the same sin torn world. We're affected by the same physical forces. We wait by the spirit that it's only through grace that that righteousness is attained. Let me say that again. It's only through his grace that that righteousness is attained. I look at Paul, we look, look back at verse chapter 3, verse 3. He asks a question, and again, he's not too happy with his audience right now. Are you foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, that same exact phrase that he's, he's talking about in chapter 5, are you now being completed by the flesh? Are you not? What are you, why are you trying to complete yourself when God started out? He's the author. That would be like me trying to fix a refrigerator when I know Brother John has got the talents. So funny, we had a we had a noise in our fridge, and John comes over and he unscrews the paneling. It's like, oh, there's ice in the fan. Takes the ice out. I'm like, well, I'm, I'll probably end up breaking just unscrewing something. So what? Did I, what? Did, when it started banging again, I just took my fist and <laughs> I just hit it a couple. I think it was somewhere around here. You know, so let me go ahead and hit it a few times. I hear it. I hear the ice come down. Okay, it's good. But see, it'd be like me trying to fix. A church van where my brother Guy can resurrect that van. The van didn't move. From what I understand for months. It don't it don't run. Guy's like, give me, give me a day. A day and fifty bucks is all it took. Runs like a champ. And sometimes you're going to hundred, which is near not really doing hundred, but it's okay. It, it runs. Point A to point B, it'll get you there there and back successfully. But be like me telling the guy, no, let, let me handle it. <laughs> My wife is probably cracking up. No, 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 no. We'll call somebody. That's exactly what's happening when we say, Lord, well, I'll fix this. I got it. Hmm. Again, we talked about Job. See, Job 
pleaded his case with his friends. He pleaded his case with God. He called God out, didn't he? God, he questioned God. You know what God's answer was? I am everything. Who are you? God says, I am. Who exactly does that make you? And the thing I, I like to look at Job about with the, with the righteousness is when Job was opened up, that book opens up, it tells him that Job was the most righteous man alive. If the most righteous man alive does not have the ability to question God, who am I? If the most righteous man of God cannot fix his own righteousness, who am I? If the most righteous man, that's why the devil picked Job. He's the most righteous man. I know he's your boy. Let me, let me take a crack at him, God. He's the most righteous man out there. Which also tells me that if you're doing things righteously, then you will be attacked. And the devil ain't going to waste his time on somebody who's already working for him. The devil ain't going to waste his time on anybody who goes into a church on a, on a Sunday morning and says, Hey, I'm here, Pastor. I'm a good Christian person. And then gets to Monday and, and goes right back to life as usual. But he is going to waste his time on those that, like those Job's of the world. It will be just like Job and will question God. No, Lord, what, what do I got to do? Pretty much what Job was saying. Well, what do I got to do? We wait through the spirit, not through the physical realm. We wait through our, our spirit, which brings us to our next thing, our last point. We wait in faith. We wait for faith. What is faith exactly? I love asking that question because I would I remember in, in children's ministry we had a, a few kids that went to a Christian academy. One of the first thing definitions they learn is the biblical definition of faith. And you can always tell the, the private school kids, hands go shoot, shoot straight up. Based on the, is the things hoped for and the things what, what, what was it, Alan? What was it? Do you remember? The, or the hope of the evidence hopeful what say that again <laughs> we can't see it but we know it's coming that's the Daryl version see the, the private school kids boy they, they spout that because they got memorization down they don't know what that memorization means but they got the memorization down what is faith it's believing without the proof of having to see something I can't see your spirit any more than you can see mine Faith is what we're waiting for that physical transformation. So if we're going to wait in faith for that physical transformation, I'm going to wait in faith for that body that used to be able to swim three miles. I'm going to wait for faith in that body that used to be able to run more than a home base to first base without, without tripping over myself. If I want to wait for that, and if i got the faith to wait for that, why don't I have the faith to wait for the spiritual transformation? You see, that's what means more. See, so what would Jesus do was all about his motivation, his spiritual motivation. It had absolutely nothing to do with the physical world. Faith. We wait for faith for the bondage of a sin-torn world that we currently live within. That's what Paul was talking about in this whole package, in this whole package of scripture where he had that hope in the middle. You're trying to fix yourself. Where, what happened to the faith part? You're trying, to, you're trying to fix something that God started working in you. What happened to the faith part? Continue to walk in faith. Walking in faith is walking where we cannot see. It's that Peter taking a step, a step out of the boat. Peter walked in faith. By faith, the righteousness of Christ becomes in the future ours. That righteousness of Christ becomes ours in the future. We have a right to that salvation because of the faith that we have, not because of anything that we do. We do because of our faith. You know, my heart breaks for those that come in and say, Pastor, I'm hungry. It's because of the faith I have that my heart breaks. The relationship between faith and hope it's so close, it should be extremely hard to distinguish one from the other. 
The relationship between faith and hope is so close that it should be hard to distinguish one without the other. We should, if we don't have any hope, where's our faith? If we have faith, why don't we have hope? Amen. I'll say that again. If we have faith, why don't you have hope? My world's going to end, Pastor. Do you have faith? Where's your hope? Too tired for hope. Hmm. So we have faith in many things. Isaiah 40, 31 says the promises that those who wait in the Lord shall have renewed strength and will be lifted up on, like, on eagles' wings. I love that picture. Those who wait, not physically, but wait in faith on the Lord will be renewed strength and lifted up like on eagles' wings. Psalms 37, 7 instructs us to be still and wait for the Lord. Be still. It's funny that that is in, but I get a prayer from, from a, a mentor every every Sunday morning. Simon, can you go back and get my phone, please? I'm going to share that prayer with you today. Do it quickly. Uh, but every Sunday he sends me, he sends me and a, probably, a, I don't know, a dozen other pastors. It's not a group test, thank you, Jesus, because our phones will still be going off, because we're in two different time zones. But he sends me a, a prayer every single week. Get it off for the live stream. Lord knows I don't need to see myself. Be still and know that I am God. I pray that today that you can make a moment and rest in the Lord. That you can realize how high, how truly high, and how best the Father's love is for you. He loves you so much he even thinks your feet are beautiful. It's a side thing. I pray that you take some time to be quiet before the Lord from all the noise of the world that will fade and his voice will ring clear in your ear. I ask our Father to allow his spirit to flood you over with peace and rest. We can only have peace if we are waiting through faith on his spirit. See, it's a spirit that does a transformation. It's that spirit that, that will clean us in full righteousness. It doesn't mean that you can't live a righteous life, but to be fully righteous. We'll attain that too. A few questions for you today before we go in prayer. Do you hope for that righteousness? Do you prayerfully consider and anticipate the next stretched out, eagerly awaiting? what life will be like when you're in that full righteousness. That full spiritual renewal where nothing but in your mind is so focused strictly on him and his desires. Do you wait in the spirit? Do you wait in faith? Where are you at today? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. As always, our altars are always open. Father, we thank you so much for your the opportunity we can have to go dig inside your word. Lord, I, I eagerly await for the day that not only there's a physical transformation, but there is a spiritual one. Where there is no temptation, there is no anxiety, there is no fear. See, these are all spiritual inequities. Lord, I cannot wait for that spiritual transformation to be full and in effect. Lord, I pray for that person today that is having a hard time eagerly awaiting. I pray for that person today that is struggling with trying to fix something that you started in the spirit. I pray for that person today that, that has that anxiety, that bondage to the law. Lord, I pray for those that are allowing that their ear to be tickled by somebody who says it needs to be done this way. Lord, allow us to be still and wait on your transformation power. See, nobody can change us, Father, but you. Nobody can, can clean us in a life of righteousness but you. No words that I can say from a pulpit, only you. Lord, we ask that you continue to mold us, continue to shape us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.
The benediction today. I'm going to go out of uh, those two psalms, those two verses from, from Psalms and Isaiah. Wait patiently on him. Then he will lift you up like on wings, like of the wings of an eagle. He will renew your strength. Go in peace. Go in love. Know that I love you. Know that I'm praying for you. Have a great week. We'll see you tonight for small groups. <clears throat>